Toby Hooper, Cannon Films, Sexy Space Vampires, Need I Say More? Actually, I probably should because I imagine that some of you don't know what Toby Hooper is or what in the green hell a Cannon Film is. Let's start off with this. If a movie is starting out and you see the credits Golem and Globus, you can rest assured that you're about to be treated to something spectacularly over the top because you're about to bear witness to a Cannon Film. The Shokasugi Ninja series, Death Wish 2 through 4, Invasion USA, Missing in Action, Delta Force, and a fucking bunch of other Chuck Norris movies. I think you basically get the picture that this company didn't mess around none when it came to producing immensely entertaining action films for the rabid cheese fanatics. Toby Hooper, a man who introduced us to a whole new level of terror with a 1974 film that earned its rightful spot as a slasher classic, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hooper went on to make some more fantastic films, like The Fun House, Poltergeist, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, a sequel that arguably outdoes the original due to Bill Mosley's show-stealing performance as Leatherface's brother Chop Top, a metal plate sporting Vietnam vet with the lunatic level cranked up way the fuck past 11. Hey, lick my plate, you dog dick. But how did Mr. Hooper fare when it came to his adaptation of a novel about space vampires? No one knows for sure, but I intend to find out? This is why I don't have dopey fucking catchphrases. August 9th, 2.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. The HMS Churchill, outward bound. On board, On board is a joint, joint British-American space team. Their mission, to intercept and study the comet bearing Dr. Edmund Haley's name. The Churchill is the first spacecraft equipped with the Nerva engine. It propels the Churchill with constant acceleration enough to create Earth-type gravity for the first time on an extended flight. The Churchill is on course for its run. Hey! The expository rundown of the plot is my job, goddammit! Now, if I may proceed without being so rudely interrupted... The Churchill is on course with its rendezvous. They stumble on what appears to be another spacecraft that's about 150 miles long, located in the head of the comet. The captain opts to go and investigate the unidentified spacecraft, which from the inside looks like a... well... I almost have a feeling I've been here before. A vagina. A supremely massive vagina. Though it's not like sexual euphemisms or anything new in science fiction. They find some creatures that, if not for the desecration, would have been perfect for Red Brown to hang glide into a cave with and missile dropkick some purple caveman. After bagging and tagging the giant bats, the USS Poon starts itself up and the Churchill crew are introduced to the only well-preserved and seemingly living remains of this now derelict tits ship. I'd say she's perfect. I've been in space for six months and she looks perfect to me. Now, I don't believe that's a fair assessment. I mean, you've got a woman on your crew, buddy. Are you even going to stop for a second to consider her feeling... Oh, sweet buttery Jesus. I don't know if perfect is the right word. I run risk of underplaying her. Shortly after bringing the sexy aliens on board, Mission Control loses contact with the Churchill. It's discovered that the ship was toasted from the inside, with the only intact remnants being the naked aliens. The aliens are retrieved and brought back to Mission Control, and it doesn't take long for shit to go haywire. Before the autopsy of the supposed dead naked aliens, one of the guards decides that it's a swell idea to check out some alien boobage, but of course she isn't dead. Just look at her. How awful could his fate possibly be? <laughs> Worth it. Use my body. All right already, movie. You've already been way too sexy. I can't believe I'm saying this, but we need some boring filler. Or she's just gonna walk around naked. This movie doesn't play fair. Okay, so as much as I'm reminded of how fucking lonely I am, this is an amazing scene. You've got this perfect 10 bombshell of a woman using superpowers against a bunch of dumpy, stupid security guards that wouldn't know what to do with her if she was tattooed with instructions, all while being gloriously naked. Mark the time. I think I've just lost my entire female demographic.
Agent Kane from the SAS is called in on the situation, aided by Dr. Bukowski of Mission Control New Britain. Tell me again how the girl overpowered you. She was fucking hot. She... was the most overwhelmingly feminine presence I've ever encountered. Okay, now I've lost my entire female demographic. SAS man and doctor man talk in great lengths about their newly encountered naked trouble from beyond the stars. I sure hope this isn't some long and drawn out scene with expository dialogue to keep the idiots in the audience paying attention. That girl was no girl. She was totally alien to this planet and our life form. And totally dangerous. You don't say! The two manly naked aliens arise by making the room explode in what can only be described as a scene straight out of Dragon Ball Z, as they menacingly approach two heavily armed guards who are only able to subdue the two dangling titans of space by exploding them with some fucking grenades. They do an autopsy on the guard that was made out with to death. Nah, he isn't dead, just really dehydrated. I like the animatronics here, or maybe not so much the animatronics, but the design and effects work looks cool. The thing just moves like a cheap haunted house display piece, so keeping the camera lingering on it for so long just isn't a good idea. Vampira's victims have her powers passed on, but they aren't to her level. Once they're drained, they have to keep feeding on the life force of people every few hours, or else... The captain of the Churchill is found living in the escape pod, and he gives them his first version of the story. The crew were affected by the naked ones, dying one by one, except for the captain, who seemed to be immune to them. He destroyed the ship from the inside and got his ass out of there. Since then, Captain Tom has been having super vivid dreams about getting it on with Vampira. Actually, it looks a lot like a fucking Danzig music video. <laughs> Hey, fuck you, man. I like that song. They try hypnosis, and it's revealed that Tom has a mental link with the bouncy space vampire. Apparently, she had hopped into a new body or something for only a short period of time to cover more ground and get to wherever the hell she needs to go. And because Tom can see what this girl looks like and where she went and who she is, they have everything they need to go on. Fuck me, hold tight. And all this time I thought that the whole hypnotizing thing was nothing to give a toss about. Nah, man. Genuine SAS tactics. Give me a fucking break. They've tracked the saucy redhead to a mental hospital where she works, and it's run by... Holy shit! Patrick Stewart? He's probably gonna be painfully underused in this film, so let's hope he hams it up like a cinematic champ. There's our killer, Sir Percy. Thank fucking God. Okay, so it turns out that Nurse Joyride is no longer under the influence of Vampyra, but she's living in Picard's body now. Where are you? Where's your body? Let me go! Let me go! Apparently, finding Vampyra was meaningless because the whole energy draining thing is spreading. One of the doctors from Churchill Mission Control finds out that to kill the original aliens, you have to kill them with, get this, a giant, leaded, He-Man looking sword. It is my belief that the vampires of legend came from creatures such as these. Perhaps even from these very creatures. I know it sounds incredible, do you hear me, Carlson? It's more I'm just gonna cut to something random and hope it makes sense. It's true. Yeah, okay, thanks. So after being told that they need to destroy the space vampires with the fucking Sword of Eternia, Vampira reforms herself out of the blood of Xavier in what's actually a really cool scene. They're on a helicopter when it happens and everything, and helicopters are always cool. Carlson. You've got to tell me what happened, what really happened on the Churchill. Time for Tom's second version of the story. Basically, he had a raging elephant boner for Vampyra, opening her glass tomb thing, and everybody died. The fact that he kept this from everybody really makes him kind of a fucking wiener. She wanted me to survive. She chose me. Why? 
Why? Yeah, yeah. While we await the next version of what really happened, London is under quarantine. The space vampires are now looming over Earth and infecting the shit out of the city. This scene is badass. Streets full of newly turned zombie space vampires ruining everyone's shit. All those little blue lights going up toward the clouds. They're human souls. How do you know that? I feel it. Tom also feels that Vampira is laying down in the middle of a cathedral, and that the remaining male alien is absorbing souls through Vampira's energy to send it up to their ship, and that when Vampira mixed with Tom, she gave him part of herself, but now she wants it back. At least according to Tom's expository dialogue, that's what's up. Starbreaker Tom cruises into town and makes a beeline for the cathedral, while SAS Kane makes a run for the magic sword. Carries your blood and soul back to the genesis of my life form. So long story short, Tom was one of them all along. Or something. Okay, it's time to wrap this up. With the city ablaze, Kane books it for the cathedral, which is now being guarded by the most fabulous of GQ models that I've ever fucking seen. It'll be much less terrifying if you just come to me. Stabbed with the blade of Eternia, the alien shows its true form and then explodes. What are these feelings? What I feel so close to you? Need you? Shut up and let me finish. Tom awkwardly makes out with the sextraterrestrial as he's past the Sword of Grayskull, which stops the whole souls going up into the alien ship thing. I really want to say that this movie is amazing, but... I must not have been paying attention to the story or the scene after scene of expository dialogue because it's pretty obvious to me that the only factor that brought me back to talk about this movie is quite possibly the most perfect looking woman I have ever seen walking around stark naked and shooting people with bolts of energy. Now I've lost my entire female demographic. So my favorite part of a movie was a naked person. I'm not the first person to feel that way and certainly not the last. Just look at her. Matilda May's portrayal of what's simply credited as Space Girl is breathtaking. This isn't just some raging testosterone chest beating way of pointing out that she's some fine hot ass bitch. What I'm doing is admiring what I see as beauty. Just absolutely drop dead stunning way the fuck out of my league beauty. Onto the film itself. It can be pretty dull and monotonous at times. I find many of the visuals to be awesome and the special effects to be pretty badass, but there are many scenes where characters just stand around describing what they're seeing, like the whole blue lights being the life forces of people flittering up toward the ship thing. And it isn't even so much a problem of too much telling and not enough showing. They're showing. A lot of showing. In fact, half the time we know exactly what's going on with the plot, but... That girl was no girl. They still fucking explain it. I sort of gave Captain Tom a bit of shit, but I'll make this clear in the end. Steve Railsback is the man. You can't really blame him for coming across like a goofball in this film, given the dialogue he had to work with. All things considered, he's been in everything from The X-Files to In the Light of the Moon, the good Ed Gein biopic. Sorry, Kane Hodder. The exposition is kind of unbearable if you watch it with your undivided attention, but if you get some friends and drinks together, you can talk through the senseless chatter and enjoy watching a genuinely beautiful woman and other stunning visuals. And let's not forget, Patrick Stewart making a brief but memorable appearance to freak the fuck out. <laughs> Patrick Stewart is the fucking man.